Deserts mean death. Infertile land that can grow no food. Deserts have many faces, and they've always been a threat to mankind. But never have they grown so fast, destroying fertile stretches of land every day. Now Europe is hit too. And as so often, the cause is man. Permanent desertification now threatens great parts of Europe. The deserts are advancing steadily from the south, for the most part, unnoticed. Deserts are zones where nothing or only certain kinds of vegetation will grow. These areas endanger people, plants and animals. And they're growing in size by the day. The worst affected country is Spain. In the Middle Ages, 90% of the country was covered in forests. Today, two-thirds of the land is at risk of desertification. And in the coming years, great parts of the Iberian Peninsula could turn permanently and irreversibly into desert. And the cause is Homo sapiens. Nature is pitiless when man neglects the environment. Leading scientists know why the deserts are spreading. This area is a perfect example of the accumulation of human errors. The chain of mistakes began with deforestation for timber production and continued with forest fires and making charcoal for agricultural use. This combination of harmful activities has led to the landscape we see here today. Tourists and visitors barely notice the environmental catastrophe in Spain. Everything seems so attractive. The Costa Blanca, south of Valencia, is particularly popular. No one seems to realize what's taking place just a few kilometers inland. Holiday makers and locals just want to enjoy life without any worries. They close their eyes to reality or believe that the parched earth is a natural phenomenon. And yet in the long run, the effects will be life-threatening for humanity. One of the main reasons for the destruction of Spain is here, right in the middle of the Valencia region. The holiday town of Benidorm, mass tourism at its most extreme. This vacation machine has been running at full speed for decades. With a room occupancy rate averaging 80%, it's the busiest of all Spain's tourist resorts. Five and a half million people visit the town every year. That's up to 350,000 a night. Benidorm has been growing since the 1960s, mainly upwards. Today, this former fishing village has the highest density of high-rise buildings in the world outside Manhattan. According to experts, the town consumes 22 million cubic hectometers of water a year. That's 22 trillion liters, a number with 12 zeros. Not even half that amount comes from its own surroundings. The rest comes from the hinterland. And average water use is 850 liters per person per day. In Germany, France or Britain, it's about 150 liters. The long-term effects of this excessive water consumption will be disastrous. But the tourists keep flocking to water parks like Aqualandia, with its 14 swimming pools and 27 water slides. In... Along almost all Mediterranean coasts, you'll find a ribbon of urban, tourist and industrial development, 
Together, they put the surrounding countryside under overwhelming pressure. The effects include contamination and salination of the limited water reserves and garbage problems. Tourism has an important role to play economically, but it has a negative effect on the environment. José Pascual is a victim of the water shortage in the countryside. He was born here, in the mountains near Lorca, in the southern region of Murcia, 52 years ago. At 20, he moved down into the valley. There was no future in the mountains. The water had run out. Now, driving through the parched foothills, José is witnessing the final phase of Spain's struggle with drought. This region has lost more and more of its population, its people and its trees. We moved away because there was less and less rain. Forty or fifty years ago it rained a lot more. Now it hardly rains at all. The trees are gone. Everything has dried out. Hardly anyone lives here anymore. Further down in the valleys, the rich people have dug wells. Up here we've lost the water and the almond trees. But when the people have gone, there's no one to take care of the land. For hundreds of years, the farmers survived the dry times thanks to their system of terraces. The water was collected here in short but heavy periods of rainfall and channeled into the reservoirs. Now, the Spanish hinterland is in decay and a unique agricultural tradition is being lost. This is a good example of a Mediterranean terrace. It stabilizes the arable land and holds it together. And it's also a good example of a place that has been abandoned and is falling apart. When it does rain here, it pours. Without the terraces, the water is no longer retained by the earth. It flows downhill and drags everything with it. The terraces and the earth are swept away. The debris then destroys terraces further down the valley. The whole system collapses. For centuries, Spain had an integrated irrigation system of canals and sluice gates. They built the system to distribute water evenly and fairly to all the fields. But today the canals are dry. The ancient aqueducts are empty. This is a result of overconsumption of water on the coast. And for farmers like Jose Pascual, it's a disaster. You can see very clearly where the water level reached 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was still at this level. Then it sank further and further, until a year and a half ago it ran out completely. Since then, it's been dry. A hundred kilometers away, near the town of Mula, everything still seems fine. Migrant workers pick ripe peaches for export to the rest of Europe. But the water to make this possible has to be bought here. This region is really only suited to growing almonds. A peach tree needs twice as much water as an almond tree. But in the search for popularity, Franco had ecologically absurd canals dug right across Spain. He turned deserts into orchards with water transported from the wetter regions. Now, water is in short supply everywhere and Franco's canals have almost run dry. If they flow at all, they're reduced to a trickle. Water has to be rationed. But in these dry areas, no fruit can grow without irrigation. As a result, the plantations are becoming more and more desiccated. This is the result of the drought we're currently experiencing. 
And nothing will change unless it rains. If nothing happens, I don't know how we can go on. This could have been a good peach for export or to make juice, but as it is, it's much too small, it's unusable. If it doesn't rain, things will be bad. This will become a desert, that's the way it seems to be going. This place needs water, just water. The farmers round about are taking drastic action. They're cutting down half their fruit trees, hoping to save the other half. It's an act of desperation. These trees are 20 years old. His father planted them. The trees are in their prime. The farmer remembers how they used to bear plenty of good, healthy fruit. They could have lived and borne peaches for another 20 years. Now this farmer must deliberately destroy his inheritance. Politicians promise that help will come from desalination plants. Pedro Carreño thinks it's just talk. Desalinated water would be good for irrigation, but I can't afford it. We don't have the money for the things they're suggesting. And they're certainly going to build the desalination plants, whether we farmers want them or not. Because there's a lot of new tourist development, and the water from the desalination plants will go to them. Even the little bit of water that still comes to us through the canals, that'll be diverted for drinking water for the new developments and whatever else they build there. Basically, it's a fraud. They're offering us something we can't afford. The water will be bought by the people who are making a profit on the new housing. Pero sí que la están comprando la gente de las urbanizaciones que son los que tienen mucho interés aquí. All that's left to the farmers is a big pile of firewood and an uncertain future. A shortage of water is damaging the wider community too. The fruit packing plants are empty. There used to be plenty of work in this cooperative. Now there's just occasional employment for the inhabitants of the surrounding villages. Most will soon leave this area and try their luck at the building sites and holiday resorts on the coast. The heartland will continue to decay. The water shortage will have a series of deadly consequences. Everything has a knock-on effect, and it's impossible to say where it will all end. Spain is on the edge of an abyss. If something isn't done soon, this country will become a permanent, lifeless desert. And yet a glance across the Atlantic would be enough to see the terrible consequences of human error. This is Iceland, the island in the North Atlantic. The land of volcanoes and geysers. It's usually thought of as green and fertile. Tourists are fascinated by the wild waters, the lakes and the rugged landscape. But also the lush vegetation. Yet this is only half the truth. Iceland is the oldest ecological disaster in Europe. 1,200 years ago, a quarter of Iceland was covered in forests. Now, the figure stands at 1%. Iceland has Europe's largest deserts. Whole sections of the island are barren. Hardly anything will grow here. But a shortage of water can't be the cause. Officially, there are very few desert areas here, but Icelandic scientists know that great swathes of the country have been ravaged and rendered infertile by human action. And they want to see the word desert redefined.
for deserts don't only occur in dry and hot climates. According to the current definition, a desert is an infertile area with limited plant growth and capacity for food production. But for us Icelanders, deserts are a vital issue, for we have enough rain, but we still have deserts. People associate deserts with heat and dryness. But the crucial question is, what happens to the water when it reaches the ground? Is it stored and passed on to the plants? And do plants actually grow on the ground? It's not a question of the climate, but of the nature of the soil. He's right. This island has plenty of water. Rivers and lakes dot the landscape. And yet often, nothing grows on their banks and shores. There's no shimmering heat or endless droughts. Yet where beech trees and shrubs once flourished, now there's nothing at all. A new definition of deserts would have far-reaching consequences for the whole of humanity. Suddenly, the infertile regions of the globe would seem much bigger. Calculations for feeding the Earth's population would be worthless. Great areas of the Earth's surface, now considered theoretically available for food production, would disappear off the maps. But why are there no plants in spite of the abundant rain? Why will nothing grow at all in most of Iceland? The reason is hidden in the complex composition of the Earth. The Earth's surface consists of several layers. Above the middle layer, which mainly stores water, is the top level, which contains the nutrients. This layer is full of living creatures. It's the layer that ensures that the stored water is passed on to the plants. If this top layer is missing, the water alone is useless. Nothing can grow. So surface erosion must be prevented at all costs. The top layer must not be allowed to disappear. Surface erosion is Iceland's main problem. Whole areas are split by chasms of erosion. Rainwater strips the surface soil off the hillsides. The heavy rainfall cuts deep scars into the once thick and unbroken covering of vegetation. Bit by bit, the humus layer is torn away. The fertile earth is borne down the hillsides and carried away by the water. Ragged, exposed edges of earth undermine plants and bushes at the roots. The constant wind makes it all worse, blowing sand endlessly across the landscape. Erosion takes a long time, but nature has time. Strange monuments stand in the desert, telling of the scale of the loss. It started a thousand years ago. There used to be a beech forest here, but the Vikings cut down the trees. What was left was grazing land, a healthy, lush green. Of course, the trees would have come back. Nature has ways of recovering. But then, the Icelanders' ancestors introduced sheep. And today, these are the main problem for the experts. Scientists like Dr. Andres Arnalds are wondering how they're going to solve this problem. The sheep are continuing to destroy the topsoil and preventing its recovery. Half a million animals that love young shoots and fresh blades of grass. And they get everywhere. When the sheep arrive, nature faces a struggle.
When a piece of land is in good condition, it has an even growth of vegetation. Grazing can't harm it. In fact, it can even do some good. But it has to be managed. And as soon as the land is damaged, for instance by overgrazing, the grazing itself becomes a critical problem. It damages the land and encourages erosion. And most importantly, it stops the land recovering. If new shoots and saplings are always eaten, sooner or later, nothing will grow at all. Fences are used to keep the sheep off some of the damaged land. You can see the difference right away. In places the sheep can't reach, the recovering soil grows green. But the fences are also unpopular. Iceland's farmers have always had the right to graze their sheep on any state-owned land. So, what can be done? The destruction of the land happens in stages. First, the stable covering of green is torn up by grazing sheep or horses. There are a total of 600,000 grazing animals in Iceland. Then the wind and the water can get a grip on the rough edges. The fertile layer is slowly worn away. This is erosion. If new shoots emerge, the sheep destroy them right away. Dead earth is all that remains. The earth here is only stony on top. Further down, it's basically all right. It contains moisture, but it has no nutrients. And that's why nothing grows. It needs to be fertilized. It would be enough to feed it two or three times with nutrient, and then local seeds will grow again. Where the earth is in a worse state than it is here, you have to bring in seeds from outside. With a little bit of help, things could be growing here in about 10 years' time. And that's why, all over Iceland, you can see people working to re-fertilize barren earth. It isn't a very complicated job. On the eroded edges, where the wind constantly strips away layers of earth, they lay down straw. It protects the surface, and it's perfect plant food. If the sheep are kept away too, new plants will be visible within a year, even in this stony emptiness. And that's when the rain becomes valuable again. Slowly the earth is becoming more stable. The wind can no longer just blow it away. The erosion slows down. It's the first decisive step. In Spain, no one seems interested in the lessons of Iceland's past. Few people are bothered by the destruction of the environment and its long-term consequences. They concentrate blindly on mass tourism, as by far the biggest money spinner available. Spain is, after France, the biggest holiday destination in the world, with more than 53 million tourists every year. And water costs the consumer less than half as much as in northern and western Europe. While wasteful water parks and tourist complexes continue to mushroom on the coast, in the interior, the deserts continue advancing. But unlike Iceland, Spain doesn't have the luxury of sufficient rainfall. In the past few years, rainfall in southern Europe has dropped by 20%. In Spain, the figure is 35%. Spain has been suffering the worst droughts in 60 years. Climate change caused by humans is making the situation worse. But the shortage of water here is a much more direct result of human activity. 
The experts blame the rash of coastal developments as one of the main causes of the problem. The owners of these apartments and villas are mainly from other European countries. The builders are profiteering Spaniards. The new apartments consume fertile land and great quantities of drinking water. And the preferred place to build them is in forests and nature reserves. So the property developers go all out to secure land in these areas. In the past few years, many protected areas have been built on. The legal processes involved seem to have been very shifty. And though local prosecutors know exactly what's been going on, it's very difficult for them to act. The local authorities and the mayors decide where you can build and where you can't. They just turn non-building land into building land. So if someone really wants to build in a particular area, there are ways and means of uh, persuading the responsible officials to alter the zoning. And then they can go ahead and build their golf course or whatever it is they want to build. Corruption is widespread in Spain, but it's rarely exposed and punished. Environmentalist Pedro Garella is one of the few people who makes it his business to raise awareness among the general public. In Spain, there have been many cases of corruption where we know that protected pieces of land have been declared building land and massively developed. The public prosecutors are dealing with a number of cases right here in Murcia. They can prove that money was laundered here, that politicians and officials were bribed to turn nature reserves into building land. In the past year, 800,000 new houses and apartments were built in Spain, more than in France, Britain and Germany put together. The building companies are chalking up huge profits. But there's a complete lack of overall planning. If you have money, you can build. And corruption makes it possible everywhere. And the houses and golf courses are built mainly for northern Europeans. Spain is especially popular as a retirement country. Thanks to cheap flights, there are more and more people who work in their home countries three or four days a week and spend the rest of their time in Spain. They're spurring an economic boom. There are already 30 gleaming golf courses in the desert of southern Spain, and a further 40 are planned. Golf club membership is growing by 10% a year. Se gana dinero en los campos de on the one hand, golf courses earn money. On the other, when the land around about is developed in an attractive way, the profits can be maximized, and the value of the land itself increased. In times like these, when urban development plays such an important role, of course people are keen on developing the land around golf courses. It adds to the overall value of the land. The golf courses are simply incompatible with the environment. You don't plant cedars in the Sahara or olive trees in Norway. The entire planning concept for the region should be based on the need to save water. Uses that are not appropriate to the climate, like golf courses or large lawns, or wasting water for industrial use or urban development, should be banned. A golf course needs one million litres of water a day to keep it green. That's the water consumption of a town of 15,000 people. Few foreign visitors are interested in the environment here, but the Spanish just shrug their shoulders too. So the water table is sinking. Wells, springs and even rivers are drying up. Towns like Lorca have already given up hope that the water will return. The Galalain River has been turned into a park. 
Once, the river was a sign of a special quality of life, as Jose Pascual remembers. This riverbed wasn't always as dry as it is today. I used to come here with my father. There were wooden bridges to cross then. It wasn't a raging torrent, but it flowed. My father told me that when he was 20 or 25, and the houses didn't yet have running water, people used to wash in the river. And he came here to fish. And Spain has to contend with another problem, the forest fires that destroy huge areas of woodland every year. 60% of them are started deliberately, and in 2006 alone, there were more than 26,000 of them. Over the last decade, two million hectares of forest and bushland have been burned. Often, property developers and speculators are obviously behind the arson. It takes years for a fire-damaged hillside to recover. After two fires, there's no chance at all. Because in southern Spain, unlike Iceland, the soil is centimetres rather than metres thick. Dig, and you soon hit rock. Many Mediterranean plant species will survive a forest fire, but the short but intensive rain showers we get here strip the earth down to the rocks. That can't be repaired by nature, and recovery becomes impossible. Dead earth, parched rivers. Spain is fast becoming a desert in which little life can survive. For farmers like José Pascual, the situation has become desperate. Now his fields down in the valley have dried out too. Thirty years ago I came here from the mountains. There was water here. I thought I could make a better life. I planted broccoli, lettuce, melons. But for more than a year there has been no water, and we don't know what the future will bring. Jose's situation is typical of many farmers in the region. Even the big reservoirs around Lorca are nearly empty. If something decisive isn't done soon, all will be lost, for humans and for nature. Spain's deep south has seen an opposite development, but one no less dramatic. Thirty years ago in Almeria, they discovered they could grow fruit in greenhouses. Now, 350 square kilometers of desert have been covered with plastic sheeting. Thanks to abundant groundwater, 32,000 greenhouses can now grow 2.8 million tons of vegetables and fruit for export every year. That's why Europeans can eat tomatoes, cucumbers and courgettes all year round. Greenhouses don't take as much water as open fields. Without them, no vegetables could be grown here. Only desert plants would survive. The natural rainfall is nowhere near enough for thirsty fruits and vegetables. A kilo of tomatoes needs about 40 litres of water, which has to be raised from deep wells. The water table has been sinking for years. In some places, it's already below sea level, and salt water is starting to seep in. At some point, the underground reservoirs will become unusable, or just plain empty. Everyone knows it. They don't know when, but it will be soon just a few years. When the water's finished, there'll be nothing. Nothing works here without water. 
Right now we still have water. I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. These ugly plains have brought prosperity to a traditionally poor region. For the first time, the local farmers have been able to live off their land. People don't like talking about saving water here, so the politicians avoid the subject altogether. It'll take nature to put an end to overconsumption of water here, rather than man. Apart from the climatic conditions, the processes of desertification are caused by humans. Humans also have the ability to reverse the process. The scientific and technological knowledge is there. But the problem is that neither the authorities nor society as a whole are aware of or acknowledge the seriousness of the crisis. And unless they do acknowledge it, urgent and effective measures to halt this process will not be taken. A new kind of greenhouse could be part of the answer. It's called the water G. The water vapor that rises off the plants is funneled into the tower, where it's condensed. The condensing water in the tower is carried by cooler fins into collecting vessels to be used again. This closed system prevents water loss beyond the confines of the greenhouses. It saves about 80% of the water. Using this system, the annual rainfall would suffice to irrigate the greenhouses. Water G is still too uneconomic to introduce on a large scale. But if the water runs out, technology like this will be priceless. The real potential of this system is that in areas where it rains even less than here, you can combine it with other water sources. You can integrate seawater into the system, or you can water the plants with recycled wastewater from the towns. A closed greenhouse system like WaterG is currently the only hope for southern Spain. But up till now, they've only built this prototype. Icelanders are actively fighting desertification. Everywhere you go, you come across the men of the National Soil Conservation Service. These barren strips of volcanic land are one of their greatest challenges. Here they till a combination of regular beech rye seeds and fertilizer into the sand. Day after day, tractors drag the cedar across the black volcanic landscape. Progress is slow but visible. After six years, this once dead land is covered in a thin film of grass. It's slowly turning back into a functional ecosystem. Winning back a single hectare of land costs almost half a million euros. They used to use aircraft to sow seeds. But now, they only do this in particularly inaccessible parts of the island. It's too expensive, even for a wealthy country like Iceland. But there's no shortage of other land reclamation programs, sponsored by the government and by institutions. So the National Soil Conservation Service awards a prize every year to farmers who take an active part in land reclamation. One of the winners, Christian Gislason, argued for years with the government's experts. He couldn't see why he should stop his sheep grazing wherever they wanted to. He was only convinced when the grassland around his own farm was no longer enough for his sheep. Today, he's proud of every meter of reclaimed soil. And now more than 25% of the farmers have joined in the land reclamation schemes. Together, they look after 6,000 hectares of land. The campaign of persuasion is working, slowly but surely. I can't tell you exactly how much of my land is newly planted. 
but it's at least 80 to 100 hectares. It's wonderful to see how things are growing again, and everything is looking so green in so many different kinds of landscape. Many Icelanders yearn for trees and bushes. The farm at Keldur, the oldest farm in Iceland, used to be in a beech wood. But over the last thousand years, the owners cut down all the trees. They used the forest to build houses and for firewood. On the meadows that remained, they grazed their sheep. They understood nothing of the erosion that must inevitably follow. Over time, the fertile land was lost here too. The ancient accounts and chronicles also talk of the volcanic ash that always returned to cover the few stubborn plants. And the storms came. There used to be neighbors here, but finally the farmers round about gave up and moved away. Only the people of Keldur fought on. They built walls out of lava rock to keep out the sand. As long as the sand keeps shifting, plants can't put down roots, and the flowing sand suffocates the young shoots. The walls saved Keldur farm from destruction. If not for them, this would be a bare mound of lava. My ancestors did something remarkable, and so I see it as my duty to complete what they started 400 years ago. It's a matter of course for farmers like Skuli Litsen to join in the land reclamation. Whenever he can, he seeds and fertilizes his land. The seeds and fertilizer are paid for by the state. It's tedious work but the results are there to see. And it also helps in the battle against climate change. For every green hectare can absorb 2.3 tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Eight years ago, I started to plant lupins and birch trees on the bare volcanic rock. Now it's real forest soil. If there's a sandstorm today, the soil can no longer be blown away, and new sand can't do any damage. The soil remains intact and can cope with it. It's stable, and it already has a proper layer of humus. Iceland offers hope. No other country in the world is tackling the problem more thoroughly. Sixty years ago, Guinnersholt, the headquarters of the Soil Conservation Service, was bare land. Now it's a fertile oasis. Over the past century, all the planting measures have been coordinated. The service spends more than six million dollars a year on land reclamation. Methods have hardly changed over the years. It's manual labor. Today, young Icelanders earn money in the summer holidays by working on land reclamation. While they're working, they live in the headquarters of the Soil Reclamation Service. And in the process, they learn what hard work it can be to make damaged land fertile again. And they also learn not to treat nature carelessly. These young Icelanders plant, sow and fertilize and they smooth down the broken, eroded edges so the wind has nowhere to take a hold. The straw bales lying here stop the sand shifting and simultaneously fertilize the ground. This work for the island's natural regeneration is very popular. There's been no shortage of applicants. Piatan Benedikason has led the work teams for years because he believes in the task and his vision is shared by many of his countrymen. Uh, 
I would like to see the vegetation from the time of the first settlements come back again, here and everywhere else in Iceland. Everything should be green and fertile. It'll take a long time before we get there. But it can be done. The state has set aside large areas for experimentation by plant and soil experts, a unique, gigantic open-air laboratory. In long years of work, they test different combinations of soil, fertilizer and plants. They measure every square meter and record every plant. They want to know how different soils and fertilizers affect the growth of particular plants. Because the interaction of the three factors nutrients, water, and the plant itself, is extremely complicated. For instance, water drainage varies depending on the preparation of the soil, over time, and according to what is being grown. This indicates that the quality of soil varies over time. In poor soil, the water seeps through too quickly, or not at all. A desert is always dry, even if there's enough rain, especially where there's no vegetation, the water simply drains away. But the earth here is moist and full of nutrients since we started planting it. This soil has the qualities of real earth. It absorbs water and gives it back to the plants. Now we want to know exactly how that works and how we can encourage and speed up the process. No nation has devoted itself to the fight against desertification the way the Icelanders have. In many places, their success is plain to see. They've made a virtue of their history, and their scientists are now sharing their knowledge with the rest of the world. They're now advising countries like Mongolia, which are also suffering from desertification. The Icelanders hope that the world will learn from their mistakes and will not let things get so bad in other countries. They firmly believe that one day their island will once again be covered by forests. We're sure that we shall win this battle against the desert. The sheep are still a problem, but we will solve it. Perhaps it'll take a while yet, but the only really important thing is whether we win the battle against the desert. And I'm quite sure we will. In Spain, things look bad. Without water, replanting the desert is impossible. Unless something is done right now, Many parts of Spain will soon be dead land. The time could even come when Spain is no longer able to feed itself. This problem of desertification links us with the Sahara, with Africa. But there's no awareness of the serious consequences of desertification in Europe, and especially here in the Mediterranean region. Economic conditions in Europe, the obsession with short-term profit, don't leave much room for environmental concerns. But monitoring erosion and adopting the right measures to combat it doesn't just have environmental consequences, but economic ones as well. That is to say that the investment needed to save these regions would have a direct effect on the areas that have been opened up for industrial, tourist and urban development. These are decisions for society as a whole. But it's clear that we need a broader awareness, a wider consciousness of this situation. Mankind shapes the earth. If we don't change our way of thinking, the desert may one day be the face of the earth. The consequences would be hunger and poverty. In the last analysis, man decides for himself how he will live on this planet. <laughs>